groups. So let me just start by recalling, I know this is uh, not totally visible, but I'm putting it up and leaving it up in a second. Um, just the words that I'm using to talk about growth, the adjectives um, and, and how they fit together. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk, I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about three things, exponential growth, polynomial growth, and rational growth. And remember that these answer different questions. Um, these address the question, how fast? And this is the blah, 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 blah. This addresses the question, how regularly or how kind of arithmetically? So they're different qualities, um, different kinds of adjectives for growth. So at least exponential growth is going to mean something like this. Um, polynomial growth, in the literature, you'll see the phrase polynomial growth. But from the point of view of my lectures, that's ambiguous. Polynomial growth could mean bounded by a polynomial or you are on the nose of polynomial. So I'm going to try to use language that distinguishes between those. And I'll talk about polynomially bounded growth, which is something like this. Um, and intermediate is going to, I won't write this down, but it means bigger than any polynomial, but smaller than any exponential. And rational growth, what does rational growth mean? Well, you can say it in terms of the beta n. It's that the beta n satisfy a recursion, or that the associated function, generating function, is uh, rational. OK, these are the same thing. OK, so started talking about group growth last time. Question. What can we say about groups um, and their growth functions in these ways? Yes? Could you remind us what, what the relations are between rational growth and the number? Yeah, so generally none. It, that is, um, that was sort of the, I wanted to think of those as the two axes. So you can have things that grow fast and rationally, fast and not, slow and rationally, slow and not. OK, so these are generally independent, speed and regularity are generally independent. But there are some relations. So one relation is that, um, as mentioned before, intermediate growth implies that it's irrational. And in fact, it implies that for all generating sets. The reason is there's this dichotomy with a rational function, whether there are poles inside the unit circle or not. And that dichotomy implies either exponential or polynomial. So you can't get anything in between. That was just to remind you the logic of why intermediate growth is incompatible with rational, rational growth. Any questions? OK, so I wanted to recall that. Um, uh, also recall that one way you can be polynomially bounded is to be eventually quasi-polynomial. That's sort of one very special thing that happens in there. And that's one more relationship. Um, I feel a little too dishonest saying recall here, so I'll just call it a fact. Um, so the fact is, we saw that um, things that are eventually quasi-polynomial, that implies rational growth. So if the beta n are EQP, does everyone remember what this means? OK, that implies rational growth. And you have a converse statement that says, if you have, this is, this is pretty fun to try and prove. This was in the, mixed in with the exercises from the first day and worth revisiting um, if you'd like to go back to it. Um, if you have the beta n are polynomially bounded, so they're in the polynomial growth range, then um, and then they, a set, they satisfy a recursion of the form beta n equals some combination, some integer combination of beta n minus 1 down to beta n minus k. So what you might call a, Fibon a Fibonacci style recursion. Um, then that actually implies their EQP. Actually, here's some, and you should absolutely prove this for yourself. That's again mixed in there with the exercises from the first day. It's a really fun exercise. Um, but let me mention 
I wrote this rather than writing rational growth because it's a little more specific. I have beta n, I have 1 times beta n is a combination of the previous ones. I bet this is still true if it's 2 or 3 times beta n, but I can't prove it. Um, try it. <laughs> um, that would be great. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Okay, so this is a pretty strong partial converse to this. It's telling you that if you have, um, if you have rational growth, if you have this Fib Fibonacci style recursion, and you're in the polynomial growth range, you're actually EQP. That's pretty strong. So you should think of EQP as being like the way you can grow rationally in the polynomial range. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you have Q coefficients, then uh, you still have rational growth, right? Yes, and that's why this is a little bit of a stronger hypothesis than rational growth. That's what I'm saying. So uh, to repeat that, that's a good point. So this is a slightly stronger, hypo slightly stronger hypothesis than rational growth. I've replaced Q with Z here. Uh. And under that slightly stronger hypothesis, polynomially bounded and rational growth gives EQP. Question for you. Um, can I uh, can I change the z to a q? Try it. I bet it's true. Okay. I also bet this is something that the analytic combinatorialists just know, but I'm not one. I'm only uh, using their the spoils of their labor. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> what other relationships do I want to point out? Um, well. So here I have this sort of magic way of deducing that things are irrational in all generating sets. There's actually one more. So I'll, I'll also call this, um, I can call this an observation. There's a second kind of group that can't have rational growth. And that's groups with undecidable word problem. Those are also forced to be irrational. OK, so remember what the word problem is. The word problem is an algorithm that tells you whether a string of letters represents the trivial word, the identity. Um, so I just want to point out that if you have rational growth that's pretty close to tantamount to a solution to the word problem. All right, so a little bit, let's think first. I would like you to explore this later, but let me. Um, think out loud for a moment about why there should be that relationship. So if you know how many words there are of each length, that's almost the same knowledge as being able to build out the Cayley graph up to a certain size. Um, it's telling you what coincidences there are when you walk around the Cayley graph. And if you know that, you know what the loops are in the Cayley graph, you know what the trivial words are. OK, so that, that is worthy of some 15 solid minutes of your life to play with and think through. But the claim that I'm making is, if you can enumerate how many words there are of each length, that's essentially equivalent knowledge to um, when you wander around and end up back where you started in the Cayley graph. Okay. So knowledge of the Cayley graph is what, is what unites um, the word problem with the counting coefficients. Questions? All right. So um, last time, let me say a little bit more about what's known. So last time I mentioned um, these two kinds of groups. We have virtually abelian groups. Those are groups with a finite index abelian subgroup. Um, we have hyperbolic groups. These are um, groups with tree-like uh, Cayley graphs. To be slightly more precise, because also we have that example of the octagonal tiling of the hyperbolic plane, to be slightly more precise about what tree-like means, um, many of you will have heard of a condition called thin triangles. And I, I just want to draw you the cartoon of that so that you've seen it next time you meet it for real in the street. Um, Thin triangles means that if you draw, um, if you take triples of points and you draw the geodesics between them, that there are points on those geodesics 
that stay really close together, thin triangles. They very nearly collide in a point in the middle. Um, this is very worth exploring for 15 years of your life. <laughs> um, but I just want to mention it so that you will have heard of it next time. But that's a, that can be taken, we turned into a definition of what it means for a group to be tree-like, is that its triangles cave in, in in some formal way, some quantitative-fiable way. <laughs> OK, so major theorem. Actually, this is a collection of the work of lots of people. Canon. Well, let me write commas, because I'm not aware of any pair of these people ever working together on this. OK, so a big theorem from the time range 1980 to 84 is that all of these groups and all of these groups always have rational growth in any generators. Why would this be hard to prove kind of by hand, messing around with the Kaling graphs? Because um, as we've seen, hopefully, trying the exercises, it's a lot of work and computationally complicated um, to figure out where you are in the Kaling graph, to navigate your way around the Kaling graph. So how could you have a hope of proving a thing like this? Well, the hope resides in the geometry. Um, you want to use some strong features of the geometry of negative curvature in this case and flatness in this case. Um, to get what you want. And I'll, I'll actually explain a little bit more how this proof works, because I'm building up to explaining um, a similar result for the null point case. OK, but statement clear? Any questions? All right. Let me emphasize why we have no reason to have expected something this strong. Change of generators changes functions in a bi Lipschitz way. It could, at worst, double things or triple things or quintuple things, and that badly destroys any guarantee of rationality that you had. In, even bounded difference destroys rationality a priori. So there's no reason that change of generators should play nice with rationality. OK? So this is a very strong result. It tells you in one fell swoop for all these groups and all their generators that you have rational growth. Yes? Why, yes. <laughs> it, so this wasn't known for until the 90s. But um, this number theorist I mentioned yesterday named Michael Stoll proved in 1996, I think it is, that it, it not only can in principle, but it can in fact depend on generators. And here's how he proved it. Uh, remember H5? This has rational growth in one generating set and transcendental in another. So it's not, it's not just barely missing rationality. It's all the way down the road to transcendentality. Yes. OK, so transcendental, remember, meant um, rational was that you have a rational function here, which means that it satisfies a linear polynomial with polynomial coefficients. Algebraic would mean it satisfied a higher degree polynomial with polynomial coefficients. And uh, transcendental is the rest of the world. Yes? They're both true. <laughs> no, no, you really are. Um, and it just depends. Because after all, we're dealing with functions here. Both of these, so I mentioned this has um, degree 6 polynomial growth rate. So it's slow in the sense of my kind of regimes of growth. Um, but this one is an EQP. And this one isn't. And I can tell you a little bit more by the end of the lecture about why. But let me say something else. You look at this and you think, wow, Stoll, that's pretty impressive. I bet these are the standard generators, and you cooked up something really weird here. No, no, these are the standard generators. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
OK, so there's something really interesting going on that I could explain more by the end of the lecture. Everybody get the statement. OK. Sure, I can tell you. Um, so looking over here, just as in the Heisenberg group, in the Heisenberg group we had these three parameters, but it sufficed to take these two, A and B, as generators because their commutator gave you C. Here, it suffices to take these four as generators because you can cook up that one as a commutator of some of the others. So this, this has rank four, as I hope you found out in the exercises yesterday. Um, this has rank four. So um, the standard generators would be to put a one in each of these positions separately. If I think about that in R4, that's the standard basis of R4, right? Does everybody see what I'm saying? Um, the alternate generating set is the cube instead of the octahedron, the cube instead of the orthoplex, i.e., instead of putting one in a single position and zero in the rest, put plus or minus ones in all of these positions and take all the different combinations. I want to think of that as a cubical generating set, and that's the one with rational growth. And actually, I'll just since I've gotten this far, I'll say, why, sh why is that remotely reasonable? It's because cubes act like products. Um, and more to come. Anyway, questions about the statement? Uh, the standard ones are the only the ones, and the middle ones. Say it again? Yeah, uh, I asked which ones are the, the non standard generators. So I can't draw R4 very well, so let me sketch it as though it were R3. So in R3, the standard generators would look like this. They'd look like an uh, octahedron. And the convex hull of the standard generators in R3 is an octahedron or an orthoplex. Does everyone see that from my crappy picture? <laughs> OK. So the non-standard generators are, instead of the basis, instead of taking the convex hull of the basis, take the convex hull of, let's see if I can draw this OK. Um, no, I think the answer is no. <laughs> that looks cubish. Um, take the convex hull of the points that you get from putting a plus or minus in every coordinate. It's dual. It's the dual basis in some sense. So instead of the generalized octahedron, which is called an orthoplex, the fundamental shape that you get is a cube, is a true cube. And that's why I'm calling them cubical generators, although I don't think he did. Does everybody get my picture now? Yes? So these cubicle generators, you put a plus or minus one in this four circles, where would you put in the plus one? Nothing. You don't need it. You can get it as a commutator of some other things. So just a zero? Sure. Or a five. Does yes? Does have a normal form with four of them? OK. You guys are really into the null potent stuff, and I love it. So that's wonderful. Let me. Um, switch around the order of what I was going to tell you and just stick with this for a while and answer your questions about these. Because I really actually am motivated to get you wanting to play around with nilpotent groups. So good hijack. Great. Let's do it. Um, yeah, so, so how do we mess around with these? Let me, let me, let's say a little bit more about working with nilpotent groups. OK, so recall, what's the definition of a nilpotent group? Brackets, um, so the commutator may not die, but commutators with commutators, with commutators, with commutators enough times gives you something trivial. Well, many of you have seen that before in the form of the lower central series of a group. So let me remind you slash tell you how that works. So you take your group, you rename G, G1. Then you form the following chain of normal subgroups. What you do, the first one here, is just the commutator subgroup of these. So, uh, so G2 is the commutator subgroup GG. What this, or I should write it as G1, G1, same thing. What this means is you take all the commutators of the elements from the group, and then you take the subgroup that they generate. That's the commutator subgroup. Any questions? OK, so generally, you can form GN plus 1 here by taking commutators of GN with G1. So that's doing exactly what I did last time. It's taking nested commutators, and then sort of one more depth gets you one further down this chain. Any questions? OK. 
So um, then I can say, this is called the lower central series. Every group has one, though they can be weird. And nil potency precisely means this takes you down to the trivial group in S steps. Let's look at this again. If the group was a billion, its commutator subgroup would be trivial. So s equals 2 would be trivial. Um, so did I do this right? <coughs> no. There. OK, now, now I've indexed it correctly so that abelian groups are one step null potent. Any questions? OK, let's make sure we understand this, because we're going to use it. So let's do this for the Heisenberg group. What do commutators look like? Remember the 3 by 3 matrix form? What do commutators look like in the Heisenberg group in terms of the matrix? What do they look like? Oh, remember what happens? No, no, sorry, I wasn't putting you on the spot evilly. I was putting you on the spot nicely. Uh, remember, taking a commutator clears a super diagonal of zeros, right? So what do all possible commutators look like here? Well, they have stuff in the corner. Yeah, they have stuff in the corner. That's a Z. That's a copy of Z. Everybody see that? So the commutator subgroup here is isomorphic to z. It's just sitting in the corner of that matrix. And then, of course, if I take commutators of those things, I die. Everybody happy with this? This is the lower central series of the Heisenberg group. So we can see it's two steps. Any questions? And what you'll see if you do h5, and I think you should, because now we know h5 matters. h5 is important. If you play around with H5, what you'll see is that, once again, it's just got a cyclic commutator subgroup. H5 turns out to also be two-step nilpotent, even though it's sitting in 4 by 4s It's not free nilpotent. It's got some coincidences, which you should explore. OK, so these are two examples of two-step nilpotent groups. Any questions? And since I've gotten this far, let me make a quick comment. Notice what happens here. You can gn plus 1 getting smaller. So you take the quotient of gn by gn plus 1. These are all normal. The quotient's going to be a group. What kind of group is it going to be? Well, yeah, I claim this is, by setup, going to be an abelian group because what you're modding out by contains the commutators. You're killing all the commutators. So in the quotient, the commutators are trivial. This is an abelian group. And by the classification of abelian groups, that means this should look like z to the dn cross something finite, and I, like all members of my tribe, spurn and scorn finite groups. I'm not going to care about that very much. Um, but I'm, I care about this one. OK, questions, though? Do you see what's going on here? Let's just see that we're understanding. So here, what does this quotient look like? Well, I've, this was the three-parameter group. When I mod out by that, I get these two parameters left. Um, and now they commute when I mod out by their commutator. So this, is a, this quotient here is a copy of z squared. Does everybody see that? Um, and of course, this one's a z. And this quotient here is a copy of z to the fourth. And this one's a z. Um, so since I've gotten this far, I can now tell you the baskey varsh formula that I mentioned last time. So what's the degree of polynomial growth? Well, the, right, this, these 2 plus this 1, that's the number of parameters. This 4 plus this 1, that's the number of parameters. It's not enough to just add those up. Cool formula, here it is. The degree is the sum of not those ranks dn, but those ranks weighted by how deep in the series, in the lower central series they are. Very easy formula for the degree of polynomial growth. OK, and let me tell you why, if you're tracking along with the group theory here. Um, this is telling you you have some z squared subgroup and some z, z subgroup. But the lower down they are, the more distorted they are in the Cayley graph. And I'm going to draw you and see some of that distortion. So you're getting a contribution from all of these subgroups with heavier contribution from the more distorted ones deeper down. OK, but um, in this example, I get 2 plus 2 times 1 is 4. This has degree 4 growth. You guys with me? What do we get here? 4 plus 2 times 1 is 6. This has degree 6 growth. OK. Questions about the formula? 
All right, but the question was, what about normal forms? And the answer is, there are always normal forms called Malchev normal forms. And here's how they work. They've got generating letters for each of these quotients in the um, lower central series. So for H, we had A, B, and then their commutator was C. For H5, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to get four letters here. I'll call them A1, A2. Um, I'm going to call them B1, B2. And then something at a, a bigger depth that's a commutator of those. Uh, let me call it C. OK, let me be more concrete. Let's take a look at the matrix form here. So uh, here's what you'll find when you mess around with this. Putting ones in these different positions gives us a nice um, I can let A1 be the matrix of the one here, A2, B1, and B2. That gives us a nice generating set for this group. And what you'll find if you play around with this, hopefully some of you did yesterday, is that the commutator of A1 with B1, the commutator of this with this, they're just lined up right to interact when you do the matrix multiplication. You guys see that? Um, so this turns out to be C. Questions? This is just a, a claim about matrix multiplication. <laughs> How, about How about the other ones? These are lined up right also. And they turn out to be the same. This is one of the relations that you need to get this from the free nilpotent group of step two and rank four. It's sort of a coincidence that this commutator and this commutator are the same. And so that's an additional relation that you need to produce this group. Um, in the presentation. Only other, um, th the other, so A1 and B2, what, what's going to happen when I take their commutator? It, yeah, right, it's gonna, their commutator is going to be trivial because they're not set up to interact when we multiply. Do you guys see what I mean by that? They're not in the right position to interact when we multiply. OK, so the, others, the, the other commutators of these pairwise are all going to be trivial. So these are the only two non-trivial commutators. And then, as before, and for more, more or less the same reason, the C letter is central. Any questions about the presentation here? OK, but that means we have this nice Malchev normal form. Check it out. We can do really easy word processing in this group. So we write down A1, A2, B1, B2. Those can be our generating alphabet. When if we have an alphabet soup of those letters, I can organize them with the A1s followed by the A2s followed by the B1s followed by the B2s. But every time I do cer push certain letters past others, some Cs pop out. So C is doing the bookkeeping of commutations. Does everybody see that? OK, this generalizes completely. So I'll just say out loud, every nilpotent group has a Malchev normal form, a Malchev basis, which has the property that it has these kind of top level letters. Those are the ones that come from this first quotient, from the abelianization of the group. OK, so it has these top level letters. And then layers and layers and layers of other letters keeping track of how often you did commutation. That's exactly, this generalizes completely. It's a very beautiful theory. This is called the Malchev theory of no potent groups. It was developed in the 50s. I have yet to find a really good book for learning about it. Uh, so I'm thinking of writing one. OK, questions? Yes? Yeah, so you can, so the Malchev normal form is prettier in the torsion free case, but you can make it work with torsion too. Um, let's talk later. Yes, you can make it work with torsion. Questions? OK, great. So um, So the next thing I want to do is spend a little time talking about um, why it should be true, let me put this up here. Um, OK, so why, morally at least, why should it be true that hyperbolic, negatively curved groups 
and virtually a billion flat groups, that the geometry is so useful that we can conclude this really strong property, rationality. Um, Oh, but before I go on, let me mention, so I've now written down on the board some results about some groups that are always rational, some groups that are never rational. And I didn't say anything much about groups that are known to be sometimes rational, or you have partial data, or with special generating sets, the group is known to be, to grow rationally. Um, so, so let me mention, there's a whole zoo of such things out there. So Coxeter groups, for instance, it's an exercise in Bourbaki, literally, um, that Coxeter groups have rational growth in their standard Coxeter presentation. I'll just name some groups now. If you know what they are, they're maybe fun to think about. Um, it's a result from the 90s of Walter Neumann, who's here, and my collaborator, Mike Shapiro, that automatic groups with their special automatic generating sets have rational growth, known whether it's true in general. There are partial results for relatively hyperbolic groups. There are partial results for certain solvable groups. There are partial, I could go on. Um, you name a nice group. It's probably been studied in the standard generators and then people gave up. I just want to tell you how amazing that is. It's really hard to prove results that depend on the generators for all generators. How about the mapping class group? Um, good question, let's talk. Way too hard with current technology. Um, <clears throat> here's how bad it is. F2 cross Z, a nice right angled Artin group, very easy to play with. Rational in its standard generators. Other generators? Hmm? F2 cross Z! <laughs> um, really hard to change generating sets and say much about on the nose growth functions. You get these coefficients, you get these generating functions. They're hard to work with. It's very hard to show whether things are rational or not. Okay. Um, any more questions about what's known before I talk more about how you can prove these kinds of things? Yeah. So what you were saying is just about the regularity or also how fast? Oh, okay, no. So how fast in, this, in the sense of growth rate, that's usually far, far easier. So like mapping class groups have exponential growth, for instance. But it's the how regularly that's incredibly hard because growth rate in those senses doesn't depend on the generators. If you're exponential, if you're uh, at least exponential in one generating set, you're at least exponential in all. The base of exponential growth might change, but being exponential won't. If you're polynomially bounded in one generating set, you're polynomially bounded in all. But you can totally wreck rationality. That's what Stoll tells us. Any questions? So maybe it's the case that there's a whole bunch of groups out there that you find in nature. Um, that have some preferred generating sets where everything's really regular and Fibonacci-like, and then other generating sets where everything goes kablooey. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about um, how you do these things. So, OK, so um, first let me, idea one. Let's look at what I want to call now patterns. OK, so it's very vague, um, but here's the idea. Let's use the motivating example of z squared. And here we are in z squared, as usual, walking around. And what I want to do is build a machine with finitely many states, a finite state automaton, if you will, um, that kind of decides whether you're a geodesic in the alphabet A and B. OK, so what I want to observe is that there are patterns that tell us whether you're geodesic. So here's a way not to be a geodesic. You don't want to go north and then east and then back south. That was wasteful. right? If you, if you go north, you should never go south. If you go east, you should never go west, right? And those are basically the only rules. If you don't do one of those, if you don't violate one of those rules, you're basically genius. So here's a way we can represent that with a machine. I'm going to label the quadrants of the plane 
in what I think is the way we do it in pre-calculus, maybe. Um, and then let me label the axes. Um, I'll call this one, let me just say 1, 2, 3, 4, and then the origin is 0. Well, check out the following machine. I can go, oh, yeah, OK, that was probably unfortunate numbering, but that's OK. <coughs> Let me think about allowable ways to walk around. So for instance, this is a perfectly respectable geodesic in the standard alphabet. Is everybody following me? That's an actual question. OK. So from, what did I do? I started at 0, and I, I began with an A letter. So with an A letter, I can go from state 0 to state 4. Um, and. With a B letter, I can do this. And then if I've wandered up the axis for a while, I can, I'm now allowed to use an A. And if I've wandered up this way, I'm now allowed to use a B. From here, I can do an A loop. From here, I can do a B loop. And from here, I can do a loop of either kind. OK, do you see how that encodes everything in the kind of positive quadrant? These are all the things I can do. I can do 500 A's, some B's, and then I can do A's and B's freely from there. But once I'm in the interior of the first quadrant, I'm never allowed to use an A inverse or a B inverse. And so I can just, it, pardon me for not color coding, I can do the same thing. And I have built a machine. OK, so this machine here, it's a directed graph. It has finitely many states. Um, and it sort of t tells me how I'm walking around. Now, um, as you probably saw when you took combinatorics, I just taught this to my um, students who are currently taking their exam. In fact, they might be answering a question about this right now. Um, uh, there's a way to count paths in a directed graph. You write down the adjacency matrix. You raise it to a power. Um, and it counts the number of paths from one place to another, right? So if we want to count geodesics in this language here, we can let the machine do it for us. And raising an integer matrix to a power, we're going to get nice recursions in the quantities that we get when we raise it to the nth power. So this is a sketch, fill in the details later, but this is a sketch of why you should believe the z squared with its standard generators has rational growth. Because geodesic spellings are decided by this machine um, that I can encode in a finite integer matrix, raise it to a power to count paths. Any questions? Does that make sense? OK. So um, essentially, it's the, I, I want to kind of argue philosophically that it's the flatness that made this so easy. It's the flatness that told us that one way of going around and the other way of going around were the same. It's the flatness that sort of made this so easy to navigate. Now let's go to the opposite regime. What about hyperbolic groups? Well, I won't say too much about it, but I'll say that um, Jim Cannon came up with the idea of what he called cone types and n types. And let me just say a word about it. It's a cool fact about hyperbolic groups. Um, that if you start at the origin and go out to G in the Cayley graph, what if you consider all the possible ways to continue? So maybe you can go from the origin to G, and then you can ask, what letters can I do next? You see how that's kind of the analogous question that this machine was doing over here? Well, Cannon calls this the cone. Um, and the cone type is, is looking at sort of what suffixes are possible. What can you tack on to the end of your word? What suffixes are possible? Well, the geometry of thin triangles turns out to guarantee that there are only finitely many cone types. And you can essentially make those into the finite states of a machine like this. And it does your sort of word processing for you in the group. It's a really beautiful idea. Cannon's original paper is, I believe, from 1983 in Geometry Dedicata, and it's worth your time. It's a beautiful paper. He was proving something about hyperbolic groups before the definition of hyperbolic groups existed, which is even cooler. OK, questions about the scheme? So this is an idea. So with the rest of the time that I have, 
I want to tell you, um, first, the bad news. It's not true that there are finitely many patterns of geodesics in nilpotent groups, even in the Heisenberg group. And it's not true that there are finitely many cone types. That's the sad news. Um, but the happy news is that we can sort of stare long enough at these ideas to extract information from Heisenberg geometry that's going to let us count anyway. All right, so let me address the question that I asked you to mess around with yesterday. What do Cayley graphs look like for nilpotent groups? So let's, um, let's focus on our poster child for today, the Heisenberg group, HZ. So yesterday, I asked you to think about the first few um, growth coefficients for this group. Count how many words there are in the standard generators of length 0, 1, 2, 3, maybe 4. I mean, 4. <laughs> um, and here's what you found. So if I started with a free group instead, so remember this is, this is the quotient of the free group of rank 2 by the relation that AB is central. So this is ta starting with the free group and imposing a rule about what kinds of words are equivalent to what other kinds of words. Is everybody with me? Well, let's start with the Cayley graph of the free group and then paste. So if we started with the Cayley graph of the free group, what would it look like? Let me draw four stages. Is that enough stages? One, two, three, four. Yes. OK, and now um, one way to see, so, so this is what would happen if I took, this is the Cayley graph of F2, no relations. And now I want to think about how this rule is going to take certain ones of these vertices and identify them. Well, um, for example, there are a few different places that if I write C for the commutator of A and B, there are a few different places that C appears in this picture. Let's find some. So one is, if I do A, B, A inverse, B inverse itself, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, I come to this point, that's a C. Does everyone understand what I'm doing? Um, well, that's also a C. Uh, oops, I missed some stuff. That's also a C. That's also a C. This is A, B, A inverse, B inverse. Oh, you're asking, is this actually C? Yeah. It is. Check it out. Mess around with it later. This is actually C. Yep. Trust me. Mm. <laughs> yeah, C commutes with everything. OK, maybe that's a, that's a more satisfying answer than trust me, I admit. <laughs> Since C is central, it commutes with everything. So it's, uh, it's alone in its conjugacy class. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, there's also some C inverses floating around. So here's one, and here's one, and here's one, and here's one. OK, so all I have to do to start making the Cayley graph for I, you see how hard it is to build a Cayley graph? Um, all I have to do to start making the Cayley graph honest is glue all the pink points together, glue all the purple points together. <laughs> OK, all right, well, there's actually a reasonable way to do that. I want to think about this as sort of the AB plane here. And I'm going to think about the C as this orthogonal axis coming out of the board. So what I'm going to do is sort of lift up the pink points and put them all where my finger is, right? Oh. I'll have a C axis coming out of the board, and that C inverse should be into the board. OK, so these four points end up here, and those four points end up down there. So what, what's happening is when you do this kind of spiraling, 
you end up coming out of the board. Okay? And if, well, usually we like to think of the xy plane as horizontal. So now let me tilt the board this way. So this thing is when you do some, when you close a loop in the letters A and B, there's some device over there that's keeping track of how, how much commutator complexity there was in there. And that's causing you to move on an orthogonal axis that keeps track of your commutators. That's a really nice way of thinking about what's going on here. So in short, I can plot Heisenberg points in z cubed. I have z cubed coordinates, right? That's what the a, the b, and the c are doing, wherever they are, a, b, and c. I have z cubed coordinates. And as I go, as I go around in a's and b's, I involuntarily levitate in the c direction. OK, let me say something a little bit more precise. Well, here's something a little bit more precise. What's the commutator of a to the m with b to the n? Well, so this is doing a, m, b, n, a minus m, b minus n. To sort these, I have to push m, a's past n, b's. So I have to do m, n flips. This is c to the m, n. Everybody with me? So that's telling us that if I, if I think about the AB plane, that I, a, a rectangle, a to the m, b to the n, a to the minus m, b to the minus n, a rectangle closes up in the plane, but it pushes you up on the c-axis. How much? Well, mn happens to be the area. OK, this persists, this phenomenon persists. So if instead of this, suppose I did some other really complicated word in A's and B's and eventually closed up. Let's do some other complicated loop in A's and B's. Well, here's what I want you to see. Anytime you turn a corner, you could have done things in the opposite. You can sort of flip stage by stage. Probably I should have done one first rather than many unravelings. But you can unravel this stage by stage by swapping some, some um, A's with some B's to get all the A's in order and all the B's in order. Right? Well, every time you swap two, so let me, let me draw it like this. Right? So I have A's, then B's, then A's, and so on. <laughs> well, if I, if I swapped these with each other, I would turn it into a rectangle. Everybody see that? And the price of the swap would be some c's. How much? That area. So you can actually prove for yourself inductively the following very cool fact. A loop in a b equals, so it's a closed loop. So the a's go away in the end, and the b's go away in the end after you simplify. Does everybody see that? So whatever you get has to be c to some power. Right, everyone? Is that clear? What's the power? The power is the signed area. And that's this inductive argument that tells you you do flip, 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 and you're just accumulating areas each time you flip. And in the end, you just get the amount of signed area that's enclosed by the loop. OK, so what's the most efficient spelling of c to the million? What's the most efficient spelling of c to the million? Let me tell you an inefficient spelling of c to the million. a to the million b, a to the minus million b inverse. That wasn't smart. Spell it better for me, please. A to the thousand. A to the thousand. B to the thousand. A to the minus thousand. B to the minus thousand. Does everybody see that? Right? So you can spell C to the million, in other words, with a long eccentric rectangle, but you shouldn't. You should spell it with a much shorter square. Does everybody understand the picture? Super. OK, great. So there's this lovely relationship between area and height in the geometry of the Cayley graph. And that's why there's all that crazy twisting in the graph. Any questions about this picture? Um, in general, you can always do this. In fact, um, there's a nice symplectic form lurking in the background for the symplectic people here that we can talk about later. Um, but um, in general, in every nilpotent group, there's this area interpretation of the coefficients deeper down in the Malchev basis. In the Heisenberg group, it's particularly nice. And the exponent of c is just recording area accrued by your path in a and b. By the way, look, we, we could already see that here. Here we were sweeping out clockwise. Uh, that's counterclockwise. Here we were sweep, sweeping out counterclockwise, and we were getting positive c's. And when we swept them out clockwise, we got negative c's. 
Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but so, do you agree that this equals this? Yeah. So then the a's cancel and the b's cancel. It's a to the m, a to the minus m. So when I switch these past these, I get a to the m times a to the minus m, and that cancels. Yeah. So it's the a's cancel with the a's, the b's cancel with the b's, leaving behind only c's. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, what do geodesics look like in this Cayley graph of the Heisenberg group? I have a little bit of time left to talk about this. So, in the after you paste everything together and you have this complicated looking grid of points in the plane, what do geodesics look like? Well, what, what, what did we learn from this example? The most efficient way to gain height is to follow not a rectangle, but a square. And that's always going to be true. So in fact, what do geodesics look like in the Heisenberg group? Well, they're always going to follow parts of squares. If I, if I look at the shadow in the AB plane, well, now we see why that's going to be a geodesic. Um, but so will it be to follow the shortest path from, oh, that doesn't look very square, but humor me. Um, the shortest path between two points is always going to follow a partial square. Okay. And the reason is basically this. What we end up doing is solving a certain isoparametric problem. So in Euclidean geometry, the classic isoparametric problem asks the question, with a fixed amount of length, how much area can you enclose? Now, apparently, humans are hardwired to guess the answer correctly to this question. Um, circles are the best way to enclose area. Right, but there's a story that we have from, um, from Virgil, I guess, that, that Queen Dido in the 9th century BCE um, was asked to solve a related problem. She was supposed to enclose as much land area as she could with a long, thin strip. And instead of making a circle, she went to the coast and made a semicircle, clever, um, and founded the city of Carthage, modern day Tunis, apparently. OK, so if you have a coastline for free, you can trace out part of an isoparam. This is this Queen Dido is with us. Um, <laughs> so if you have a free coastline, you can trace out part of an isoparametrically optimal shape. OK, so what's going on here lurking behind the scenes is there's an implicit norm on the AB plane. In this case, that norm is the L1 norm. It's the norm that counts how many moves you made in the A and B direction, right? The word metric is just counting your steps in the A and B direction. That's the L1 norm on the plane. And the isoparametrically optimal shapes in the L1 norm are squares. And so geodesics should either follow squares so that they can enclose as much area as possible for their length, or partial squares if they don't want to completely close up. And I can say much more about this later, but I'm trying to give you a flavor of the math, a rigorous flavor, I hope, of the math that goes into this. OK, so here we get squares and partial squares. Well, that doesn't look terribly much like a square, but that's just because you do That's because I'm a terrible artist. OK, OK. So I mean, yeah. it's longer than it is. Yeah, let me actually, let me make these a little more honest. So that length looks like about that length, maybe? Yeah. So that's a partial square. Yeah, so they really should be partial squares, not rectangles. Squares, not rectangles. Squares are more efficient at enclosing area than rectangles. Yeah. Sometimes you're still going to have to use a rectangle, right? Like if you want to see cubed, you can really. No. So what you should do is take the square root of and Q. Oh, oh, but but there's a good point here. Um, when I'm dealing with words, I'm dealing with some things that are discrete. Discrete things have like a bounded amount of messy fuss. But when I'm dealing with large enough words, so yes, yeah, C cubed, sure, that's a special case. But C to the three jillion? For C to the three jillion, I should really take the square root of three jillion and form the square of that side length. But it would have 
what if you had a really, really large truck? Sure. Uh, um, so there'll be a bounded amount of mess. And actually, controlling that bounded amount of mess is important because I want rationality. Um, so that's a. But so the first, the first order answer is um, up to a pretty decent approximation, things are going to follow these partial squares. Then you have to fuss with the error. Absolutely. Questions about the scheme? Okay.